Okay, great. Well, thank you and welcome to Climate Change Meaningful Solutions at Home and in Your Community, brought to you by Sustainable Warwick Climate and Energy Committee. Um, my name is Elizabeth and I'm here as the moderator because I'm a new homeowner in the Hudson Valley area. And I had lots of questions when I joined Sustainable Warwick about how to make our home more sustainable. And so I turned to uh, Michael and now Bill and Mary and they had such great tips uh, for a new homeowner or even for an old homeowner. And they thought it would be maybe useful to bring these tips to the wider community as part of the Hudson Valley Climate Solutions Week. Um, so they're gonna go through and, and talk about the five top areas to think about um, how you can improve your sustainability both at home and in your community as the title says. Um, and one thing that really has struck me as we're talking is just how many of these things are actually beneficial for us even beyond being beneficial for the climate. Um, they can actually help us save money separate and apart from all the good that we're going to do uh, for the earth that we have to share. So. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce our expert panel. We have Michael Helm, who moved to Warwick eight years ago, and he first encountered Sustainable Warwick when Bill Makovsky, also on our panel, helped him with the NYSERDA program for a home energy assessment. Since that time, Michael has been an active member of Sustainable Warwick, and he's now on the steering committee. In 2020, Michael completed the Energy Navigator Training Program, sponsored by the Cornell Cooperative Extension. Bill Makovsky is a retired professor and an environmental and energy physicist. Uh, after retiring, he became involved in Sustainable Warwick over a decade ago when it was first founded. His research work includes environmental pollution, sustainable energy, and climate. He and his wife, Mary, designed and built a net zero energy solar house in 1998, so early adopters here. Um, and then Mary Makovsky was an English professor at Orange County Community College. She's been active with Sustainable Warwick for about 10 years and served for a time on the steering committee. So with that, I'm gonna to turn to just a few housekeeping items. I think some of you who joined early heard that, but we're gonna to try to keep all the participants on mute. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. We have a lot of information to share tonight, but um, we might have some time for Q&A at the end. So I'll be monitoring the chat while we're going on. And if we have time for questions, I'll pose them to our panel. And I also really wanna thank everybody for being here live with us tonight. But as you heard, we are recording this. Um, so there are two benefits of that. First is there is gonna be a lot of information. If there are some areas that you wanna go back and visit, the recording will be available so you can get the information again. And also please tell your friends and neighbors to check it out so that they can also um, learn about some meaningful solutions for their homes. Um, and one final piece of housekeeping news, there will be a resource list that we'll be sharing. And it's a really helpful checklist that goes through point by point. Uh, a personal recommendation of mine is you might wanna, as you're going through this, kind of circle a couple of areas, like jot down a couple of notes of priority items. And when you get that checklist, you can kind of flag those pages and then you'll have all the key points that you can check off as you do them. So I think it'll be a really helpful resource list, good links in there to helpful organizations and other information. So with that, I would love to turn it over to our expert panel. Okay, well, thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. In this webinar, we'll describe five steps to a climate-friendly home. The first three steps are about uh, the physical structures of our homes, and they comprise a simple outline for transitioning a home, almost any home, to a net zero home. Okay, net zero homes, they sometimes have a reputation of being for the ultra wealthy, but please don't believe the hype. Tonight, we'll describe practical and cost-effective steps we can all start taking. Maybe not everyone's home will reach the net zero target, but we'll all understand the basic guidelines for getting there and how progress is possible. The fourth and fifth steps address what we eat and, and some of which we may be, may be produced in our own yards and how to take advantage of our yards to make positive environmental impacts, including capturing carbon. Before we elaborate on these five steps, we'll talk about finding good advice and community support. And at the end, will encourage advocacy for systemic changes. Uh, there's a lot to cover, to cover, so let's get started, huh? Uh, it takes a village, right? Uh, it is an immense help 
to regularly interact with people engaged in sustainability issues. So we strongly encourage audience members to join a local sustainability group such as the ones listed here. When you participate in these groups, you'll find people will raise questions you didn't know to be asking, and you'll certainly have experiences to share that, other, that will help others. So these group dynamics are extremely valuable. We also want to recommend the Cornell Cooperative Extension because it, it helps homeowners to understand and take the steps to a climate-friendly home. The resource checklist that uh, Elizabeth mentioned that we'll be providing later this week um, has contact information for community energy advisors and energy navigators who can explain uh, what programs are available in New York State and what is cost effective. And they do this without recommending or endorsing specific companies or products which make them an outstanding uh, consumer resource. Um, another great community connection is the community gardens that we have access to. Uh, there you'll meet people uh, with uh, a wealth of gardening experience who are happy to share that experience with you. Um, and it's usually a great idea to ask around your neighborhood or among friends for someone with solar panels or a flourishing garden or who has done any of the other things we will discuss this evening. Uh, don't try to re reinvent the wheel, just find the right people to help. At this point, I'll turn the floor over to Bill, who will tell us about the big ticket energy efficiency items, uh, the most important ones to focus on. Bill? Thank you, Michael. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, energy efficiency is a critical first step that we need to take uh, for many reasons. It's cost effective, it saves energy, saves money. It enables the downsizing of heating and cooling equipment, which will save even more money. And it provides greater comfort in the home. The first slide here that I'm showing uh, indicates a blower door on the left with a technician who's operating it. And on the right is a little infrared camera that is looking at the uh, leakage or heat loss in the wall. Now, I'm sure you don't have these devices in your home. Uh, that's why these experts are necessary to be able to do an adequate energy audit of your house. Heating and cooling actually use about half of your home's energy, so it's a big item. So we recommend you get a professional energy audit. And this happens to be free for most people, depending upon your income level. The state uh, subsidizes it. And uh, we, we, we think that everyone, just about everyone, I mean, if you have a really new house, uh, probably it doesn't need uh, an audit. But uh, most other houses uh, probably are using much more energy than they should. Now, when you remediate the heat loss, uh, you can save 25, 30, even 35% of energy costs. Uh, that's not a small amount. But the audit and remediation is probably not something that you should do yourself. Um, it, it is a little bit too complex for most homeowners. Um, now, you should appreciate a remediation is not redoing your entire house. It's more like a tune-up. Uh, for a car. So that's good. It may take several days to do the work, but it's not, it's not going to take a week, most likely. It may even take one or two days. Uh, you reduce your fuel use and save money. And the programs that exist uh, offer some uh, money from the state, depending upon income. And those things change with time. So it's important to check in with community energy advisors to see what the latest deals are. Uh, this slide shows an infrared camera from the outside and you can see the house and the blues and greens have less heat loss. The yellows and reds have more heat loss. You can see, for example, that windows have quite a bit of, uh, of heat loss. Um, so anyway, how do you know if you really need an energy audit? Uh, well, one, does your house feel drafty and cold in the winter? Uh, do you have high heating and cooling bills? Uh, do you have to keep your thermostat high in the winter to stay warm? 
uh, do you have an older house, say more than 10 years old? All of those are good indications that you might need an audit and remediation. Uh, this slide shows uh, your source of energy. On the left, it happens to be a boiler that is providing heat to the house. So you can, you, people heat with oil, gas, or even electric. Uh, this energy balances the heat loss that you have from your house. And when they balance, the temperature stays constant. Now, the heat loss is determined by the quality of the thermal envelope. And the thermal envelope is just a shorthand way of talking about the surrounding insulation that you have and the air tightness of the house itself. Now, air exchange loses a lot of heat because when cold air comes in, it has to be warmed up from whatever temperature the outside temperature is to the inside temperature. And many houses lose one or two complete air changes every hour. So this slide just shows that a lot of cold air comes in in the basement, in the bottom of the house. It's heated and heated air rises and it finds its way out the various cracks that lead to the attic and then to the outside. So simply, uh, well, in the attic, you have an attic hatch, a chimney, pipes, recessed lights, et cetera. All these things usually allow air to leak around them. So more leaks means more drafts, means less comfort, means more energy use and higher bills. Uh, this shows a man insulating the attic. You'll notice that he's putting cellulose insulation on top of the fiberglass, which turns out to be an inadequate amount uh, in the attic. Um, more insulation may be added fairly easily to attics, basement, and walls. That insulation is usually in the form of fiberglass, cellulose, which is shown, and various types of foams. Now, payback time is something you may have heard of, and it's a fairly simple con uh, concept. Basically, how long does it take to pay, ba pay back the money that you spent for an energy upgrade? And so it answers that question. So what it is simply is the cost of the improvement or the, the, uh, the energy uh, device that you paid for divided by the, uh, the cost of the energy savings per year, or basically just the energy savings that you get over the year. Uh, 10 years is considered good, less is better. Now, I just wanna illustrate it with a very simple example, uh, an LED light bulb. Uh, a 13 watt LED replaces a 100 watt incandescent. LEDs are more expensive. Maybe it's two or three dollars for an LED versus a dollar for a typical incandescent. Well, the energy, the electrical energy in kilowatt hours is just a product of two things, the kilowatts times the hours. So what we see is that for the incandescent bulb, uh, five hours a day for the year, it's in a 20 cents a kilowatt hour, it costs $36 approximately, and the LED costs you five. And so simple payback says, okay, the extra cost in this case estimated to be $1 divided by the savings per year, $31.75 per year, gives us 0.03 years as the payback time. Now, I don't know what 0.03 years is exactly, but I can change it into days and it's 11.5 days. So this is a pretty amazing payback time because we said before payback times on the order of 10 years are considered to be very good. And even if the LED cost you $3 or $4, your, your payback time would still be on the order of a month. Now, um, The infrared, infrared camera slide showed windows as a big energy loser. So a question you might have is, should you replace them? Well, the answer is generally no, 
because new windows are quite expensive and typical payback times might be as high as 50 to 60 years. But if the windows are in awful shape, uh, the answer might be yes, but normally you can do other measures to make them better without great expense. And some of these things include temporary caulking if they are leaky, uh, adding a layer of plastic if it's a single pane of glass, or possibly making insulating panels for the windows, which is illustrated in the following in this slide. So uh, the panels are made by covering foam panels that you buy with fabric fastened with aluminum tape. Um, the R value of the panels is that R value is just a measure of resistance to heat flow is one for a single pane of glass. And if you use a panel, it raises it by about eight. So in my case, the windows have an R of 3.3 because they're, they're pretty good windows, much better than single glazing. And with the panel, I'm talking about an R of 11. Well, that makes those windows equivalent to my walls. And uh, that means the heat loss is much less and you will feel very much, much more comfortable in a room that doesn't suck all your energy out. You know, in other words, your, your windows are cold and you're gonna essentially lose a lot of heat to them and you're gonna feel cold. These are simple to make. They don't have to be super tight. They look good, they are effective. Uh, they do take a time commitment to put them in and out of the windows each day. For me, for my whole house, it takes me about 15 minutes a day. That includes putting them in and taking them out. And I find the extra comfort level and energy savings worth it. Uh, let's move on to the major appliances. The four appliances shown here, which you can identify, I think, uh, refrigerator, dishwasher, clothes washer, and dryer, uh, account for 90% of your uh, appliance energy. So you don't have to worry about the efficiency of your electric knife. When these appliances break, which they do quite often, and they've reached the end of their lifetime, it's now time to buy a new one. And what you should do is select the, uh, a very efficient appliance based upon the energy guide, which is shown in the diagram here. What it does is tell you the kilowatt hours. We talked about kilowatt hours before. Uh, what what it, the, the energy use is over the year for operating that device. So pick one that's really low, pick one that meets your needs. And uh, we also recommend that you plan ahead for your appliance purchase by identifying good appliances before your appliance breaks get a couple of good models in mind and where you can get them. And uh, you'll be appreciate that when, when your appliance breaks because usually you're in a hurry and you may not feel you have time to search around for the best appliance. Well, hot water is another area where you use a lot of energy. About 25% of your house energy goes into making hot water. So you have some kind of a tank uh, and some of the things that you should do, whether it's a propane or a gas or electric tank is look at the efficiency rating when you buy it. Buy an efficiency, a high efficiency water heater. And we can tell you right away that a heat pump hot water heater has the highest efficiency. And that's one that we recommend that you look at. Another thing that you can do is reduce the thermostat setting on the device to 120. And uh, that should uh, save you some money because more than 120, you might actually uh, burn yourself where your children could get burnt, whatever. So um, you don't want it higher than it needs to be. And another thing that helps is uh, in appliances where you use hot water, uh, for example, your clothes washer, uh, you can use cold water detergent. And that saves a lot of water over the year because most people do two, three, or four washes a week. And that's, that's a lot of water to heat up. On the right side of this, you can do some other things as well. 
Uh, you have hot and cold water pipes that enter your heater. So you can apply insulation, just uh, very cheap, buy it in the hardware store, and you can add it to the pipes for maybe three or four feet. You don't have to add it everywhere, but the first three or four feet are the most important ones. And if the tank is electric, you can add more insulation to the tank itself. Again, very easy to do, very cheap. And you can also save more hot water by installing a low flow shower head, something on the order of one and a half to two gallons per minute if your existing shower head is more than that. Now, in addition to uh, efficiency, there's something else called energy conservation. And I think using a cold water wash detergent fits into that category because conservation means you change the way you do something so it saves energy. Energy efficiency means using technology, some kind of technology to use less energy per, to perform the same task. They can both be very effective, but with a lifestyle change, you have to keep doing it to continue to have savings. Now on the right side of this, uh, we have another way, uh, I'm sorry, on the left side, uh, I'm suggesting that you use a cold water wash detergent, which doesn't cost more money and is a very easy way to save a lot of energy. And on the right side, I'm suggesting that we have technology here, a solar wind powered clothes dryer. So it's a technology, but it also requires a lifestyle change in the sense that you then need to do something to get your clothes to the technology. The protocol, choose a sunny day, choose a non-freezing day, get the wash out early, bring it in at dusk and let it dry a little more if needed. Now a solar wind powered clothes dryer works fine for eight months of the year. However, there's four cold winter months. So, you know, what happens then? Well, it turns out it works pretty well in the winter months as well, because the air is usually much drier. You're putting it out on a sunny day, not a snowy day. And the wind is greater in the winter. Uh, all you need to do that is to have a little bit more motivation and stick to itiveness to do it out over those four months. It works. Michael, before we move to the next section, I just wanted to emphasize a couple of points of bills that I thought were really helpful and have resonated with me as a homeowner. Um, one of them is with respect to the energy audit. I don't know if this is still the case, but it was something I had dragged my feet on and then I realized I could get it for free. Um, an energy auditor came and did that fancy blower door test on my home for free um, and then provided me an estimate to do some tune-ups that would come out of it. And for me, that was just a great first step. I was a, a little hesitant at first thinking, oh, I'm going to embark on this big journey, but it was free. Um, and they actually helped me with some also free tips. There was an area by my front door that was drafty and I thought, oh, I'm going to have to replace windows. And because we did the test, they actually found there was something loose and we just kind of stuck it back up in there and I found a, a noticeable improvement. So it's worth getting somebody in. Um, all the tips were great ones, but that was one I had personal experience with. And I just wanted to share that. Um, with folks who are looking for a quick and easy way to maybe realize some savings in their homes. And I want to add um, that, um, that we did the home energy audit and had the work done. And I think we say our, our fuel bill was, was reduced by about 20 or 25%. And that was like uh, seven or eight years ago, which so you, you stop to think about what your annual fuel cost might be. And it, it really adds up quickly. Yeah, and I don't want to take us too far off, but my dad actually replaced, he ha, he lives in Florida and he kept a, an AC unit that was sputtering because he didn't want to pay to replace it. And when he finally replaced it, he was like, I was paying more in a year when your bill was talking about payback costs. I was kind of laughing to myself because he said he was paying more in a year for his energy inefficient AC than he was once he replaced it. He, he got, made back the money that he spent on it. So some of these fuel guzzling appliances you think you're saving by not buying a new one, but to Bill's point, when you do the math on it, um, it often really just makes good financial sense. It's a good investment in your house. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. So 
in our next section, um, you know, it makes sense strategically to do efficiency work first. Um, although adopting different efficiency measures may be done over time, and before they're all completed, you know, people will probably want to get started with beneficial electrification. And, and so usually this refers to switching from a fossil fuel burning home heating system to heat pumps, uh, which run on electricity. Um, and Bill will introduce heat pumps, but we'll also talk about other ways to implement beneficial electrification. Bill? Okay, and in the long run, as you switch to electrical appliances, so your whole house is electric, uh, at some point, the grid becomes more electric, which it is year by year. And uh, Michael is gonna talk about ways where you can uh, get your electricity from solar, which would make all of your electricity use clean. Anyway, in this case, I'm showing a, a heat pump. Heat pumps are an electrical way to heat your house. And on the left side is my heat pump, which I installed last year. And uh, it just sits there and it takes the heat out of the air and adds it to the house, or it takes the heat out of the house and puts it outside. It's an air conditioner and a heater both, and you just choose which one you want it to be. Um, so it's very efficient. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, a, great, a great choice. Now, um, on, the, on the other side, uh, on the right side, on the floor, we see a little device that's called an inverter. And this is how the heat comes into the house or the cool comes into the house, depending which one you want, uh, when you operate the heat pump. And so you have these distributed uh, into different rooms or spaces and uh, you control them with a little uh, control inverter button uh, thing that you push, a control box. And- uh, It's like uh, a TV remote. Yeah, it's kind of like a TV remote. Okay. Now, one other thing I wanted to mention that in the window there is a fan that's not related to the heat pump. And uh, it's a whole house window fan, which I used before or instead of using air conditioning. All you need to do with this is open your window here, open a window on the far side of the house and operate the fan, usually at night or early in the morning. And it really, if the conditions are right, it cools the house right down. And then you close up and, uh, you know, if, if it stays cool enough over the whole day, you just, you know, do it again the next day, or you can turn on your heat pump air conditioner. So anyway, um, I find that the, the I, I used that for like 15, 16, 17 years on my house. I never had an air conditioner until last year. So, um, you know, the whole house fan is a way to, that's very efficient, that works. Now, the heat pump uh, and the units that come in are sometimes referred to as mini splits because one heat pump can actually be split up to operate several indoor units. And uh, so those inverters that I call them could be, uh, all they do is either circulate warm air or they circulate cool air into a room space. And they can be on the floor as a radiator, they can be on the wall as shown here on the left side at the ceiling, or they can actually be on the ceiling. So you have floor or wall units in various places. In my case, three inverters run off of one unit but it depends on the particular situation, how much heat loss there, there is and in a particular space and so forth. So you may need more than one heat pump for a house or maybe one will do. Uh, you may have several inverters or maybe only a few will do. This has to be determined by someone who comes in and evaluates your house. As I mentioned, they heat or cool and the heat pump must be something called a cold climate heat pump uh, those operate to minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter. Um, you don't want to have a standard heat pump because they do not work well as the temperature gets very cold. So um, you have this remote control unit that operates it very easy. Today I actually switched over from my air conditioning uh, to my heating on my, on my heat pump with all the units 
and it took me all of about three minutes to do it. So it's very, very easy to do. Uh, it's sized to the needs of your house and the installation is very easy. There's no ductwork involved. So, you know, the unit goes on the outside. There's some small uh, uh, hoses that and stuff like that. Speaking of size to the needs of the house, if, you've, if your house was poorly insulated, you might need a bigger heat pump system. If you've done the energy audit and had your house insulated, you could end up with a less, of, less expensive and less smaller size heat pump system. So it's the, the efficiency really should precede the beneficial electrification, especially for heat pumps. Absolutely. And one more thing about heat pumps before I uh, go on to something else is that heat pumps can operate off the air or they can operate off the ground. And the ones off the ground are called geothermal heat pumps or sometimes ground source heat pumps. And they tend to be somewhat more efficient because the ground stays warmer uh, in the winter compared to the air in the winter. And you put coils, uh, for example, pipes in the ground, usually at six feet deep or, or maybe even a little bit more. And uh, you can also take the heat from the cool water that exists in the ground, either through wells or through fairly large ponds where you can put coils in, in the pond itself. So all of these things are taking it from the ground and it's an alternate way to, um, to consider heat pumps. Uh, the ground source heat pumps can supply hot water as well as heating and cooling. So, um, so they're a little bit more efficient. They, uh, they can supply hot water. They tend to be a little bit more expensive or sometimes even a lot more expensive because you have more installation costs to put the coils into the ground. And it, that makes it a harder installation. So anyway, uh, these ground heat pumps are most of the time used with new construction because you haven't really done anything to the outside of the house yet, the grounds. So you're not messing up lawns or uh, gardens or trees. And, uh, and the, the air source heat pumps are most often used for retrofits for an existing house, but you could use either one. And going into beneficial electrification a little bit further, uh, we have the electric vehicle. And uh, the left side uh, on the top shows uh, that your engine, your combustion engine, which pollutes a lot, 25% of all the greenhouse gases come from our transportation system, is replaced by a clean electric motor generator that sits where the engine used to be and it runs the car or it charges the battery. It's a very simple way of doing things. Now, the electric vehicle, I've had one for five years now. Uh, I love it, my wife loves it. Uh, it charges up not only when you plug it in, but it charges up whenever it slows down. So it's called regenerative braking. It's extremely quiet. Most people are amazed when they ride in it because they don't hear anything. Of course, you can hear a little bit of road noise. Uh, another big advantage is they have very little maintenance. Uh, the, the, uh, without spark plugs and uh, mufflers and all kinds of things like that, you don't have a lot of maintenance. The only thing I've done in, in five years now for my car is to rotate the tires. I consider that very little maintenance. Now charging shown in the lower slide, uh, I just plug mine into uh, a 110 volt outlet in my carport and it charges up overnight. And if I wanna charge it quicker instead of overnight, maybe, you know, it takes me 10 or 11 hours to charge up, but you know, I'm, I'm home that time. I'm not doing anything, the car is just charging up. You can put in a little bit larger uh, voltage like 220 and it will charge up in less than half the time. So the other option, uh, which you don't have to, on your home, but if you're taking the car for a trip, uh, there are places, and, and it's gonna be a lot more places that allow you to have a quick charge 
where you can charge up your battery in a very short time, 20 minutes or a half hour uh, while you stop for a cup of coffee somewhere. So uh, those are the charging options. Now the range, some people worry about the range. Uh, new ones have ranges that vary, but maybe 250 to 300 plus miles before you have to charge the battery. Uh, mine is 100 miles, and I wish I had it a little bit larger, but it's okay. And they cost more, but uh, for certain models um, and new, new electric vehicles, there is a $7,500 tax credit, and New York State often offers a, a, a tax credit as well. And that $2,000 is the most you can get, but it depends on the battery capacity and the number of vehicles that have been sold in that model. So um, when you look at the price, think, oh, well, wow, that'd be ten, almost $10,000 less than you're looking at. And, and very little maintenance costs. And yeah, I mean, charging the, uh, changing the tires is not exactly a heavy duty thing. Uh -uh. So anyway, uh, I'm done for now and I'm gonna transition to Michael who will give us some more ways to uh, do beneficial electrification. So there are a few other ways we use fossil fuels that we can change and change for the better, including changing from a gas or propane powered stove to an electric stove. Uh, and, and then besides stringing up a clothesline, there's also electric clothes dryers as opposed to you know, a gas powered clothes dryer. I've recently heard that um, as far as like a gas stove, that there's a higher rate of asthma in homes with people who use gas stoves. Isn't that interesting? And so, so many benefits to switching off away from fossil fuels to uh, a clean electricity. And then out in the yard, there, there are so many advantages to changing away from gas powered tools. Besides the operator no longer having to breathe nasty fumes, the whole neighborhood appreciates that the, 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 the sound of these tools is just much lower. It's just really nice. And also, just like the cars, the electric tools need way less maintenance than gas powered tools. Um, so before we move on, Elizabeth, do you have any questions about beneficial electrification? Sorry, I was having difficulty unmuting. Um, we did get a question about the energy audits, and I provided some links in the chat to some resources that I'm aware of. But if you all know anything off the top of your heads, or if you want to let that thought marinate um, and you want to share anything, we did get a question from Eileen. Um, I'll give you a second if, if you want to say something more on that. OK, well, um, that's in the Save resource checklist. Really. Yep, um, perfect. If you want to find it and there, and send it, but I saw you sent something that looked right. Perfect. And then I just wanted to give another plug for the beneficial electrification on the yard tools. Um, I have, we're new homeowners that I mentioned. Um, I've never used a chainsaw in my life, but I did invest in some battery operated tools, figuring we're going to have some yard work to do. And I have some very helpful neighbors who are like, you know, in the Hudson Valley for decades and decades. They have multiple chainsaws experts. And they asked to borrow mine because it's so lightweight. It's so much easier to use. It turns on when you want it to turn on and then you're done with it and you don't have to like leave it there idling. Um, and so for me as you know, the newbie on the block, it was kind of a, a nice little thing beyond what Michael said, not having to breathe the nasty fumes, not having to hear the loud noises, but it, it made me feel confident that they actually, they know chainsaws and they know power tools. And this was hanging with, their you know heavy duty tools and um and so it felt to me like a good investment in our future too because it's so easy to use i know i'm going to get a lot of use out of it and i'm not sacrificing anything by having it in fact it's all benefits so a lot of good points here uh, by both michael and and bill but just wanted to give that one little tidbit of something that i've implemented and, and found it really helpful that's that's a sweet story thanks for thanks for adding that one Okay, so after we've reduced our energy needs through efficiency, and after we have adopted a beneficial electrification, what if the electricity we are using is generated by power plants that burn natural gas or that burn coal? Well, in New York State, we're lucky because there are ways for almost everyone uh, to get clean energy by going solar. Let's, let's look into the details. 
if you can responsibly afford to buy your own solar, solar panels, they're a good investment. Some companies offer to put panels on your home and lease them to you, but usually these arrangements should be avoided, and we'll come back to this point later. Uh, as far as buying your own panels, um, you should know it's a big upfront investment that will provide electricity to your home for 25 years or more. You can think of this as owning your own power plant, which gives you the best possible price on electricity. You could lock in a price of something like 8 to 12 cents per kilowatt hour for the next 25 years, and you can compare that to the O&R price of 18 cents per kilowatt hour, uh, which is likely to rise over time, and, and, and maybe it's at a rate of something like 3% inflation per year. Um, to invest in your own solar panels, you need to have the right financial situation, and you also need good solar exposure on your roof or somewhere on your land. If there are trees in the wrong place, then it won't quite work for you. Um, any, any responsible solar installer will generate a cost estimate with upfront incentives from NYSERDA, as mentioned before. And, and that may amount to something like 10% of the total cost of the system. And while you need to pay the rest of it upfront, you'll qualify for a 26% federal tax credit and a 25% New York state tax credit. And let me emphasize, these are credits, they're not deductions, which means come April, the following April, actually you can file your taxes early that year because you'll be getting all that money back. So you want to file your taxes early, as early as you can. And it would, you'd recover more than half of the cost of the system. Uh, although one thing to point out, the, the, um, the New York state tax credit, the max you can get back from that is $5,000. That's 25% of the first 20K. And I've got an example here for you that I'm really uh, interested to share this. So this is a, a quote that somebody was recently given. And if you get a quote for a solar system to be installed, get at least two more, right? Because different companies will have different prices for same things. So you don't wanna just get one quote. But to me, this, this quote just looked really compelling. So this person needs about 9,500 kilowatt hours per year. And so they decided he would need 27 panels. The total cost of his system uh, of the system is just out of the box is $36,500. Now for this particular system, the NYSERDA incentive would be uh, 3,600, it's about 10% of that. What I've heard is the bigger the system, the higher the percentage is, and the lower the system, the smaller it is, although it maxes out at a certain number, 8,000 some odd for the NYSERDA incentive. Beyond that, they won't give it to you. Um, then, but, but basically, um, the cost that you have to be concerned about then is that $32,900 you see there. Then um, the federal tax credit, 26%, that's over $8,500. The state tax credit, you're getting the max you can get from New York State, and there's another $5,000. So basically, out of pocket for the system, this person's going to spend $19,000. Um, and I just want to point out that he's spending, he's spending that, but he'll be getting $1,700 worth of electricity from it in the first year. And then usually you should consider a, an inflation rate. So when they calculated this, they told him in basically in, in maybe eight years or so, uh, he would have paid him paid this this cost of the system would have paid itself back just from the money he saved on electricity. And just as a monthly bill before and after, you know, if you're getting that much electricity, you're spending about $160 a month on electricity. And if you have solar panels that are covering all of your electricity, you still get that $20 uh, a month charge that, that, will, that goes to O&R for, for basic service. So, you know, this, from this example, I hope people could look and say, oh, um, my, you might think, I, I, I live in an apartment, this doesn't apply to me. Or you might think, oh, my, my home only uses half that much electricity or twice as much electricity. But I think it gives a good ballpark of what a good deal it can be to go solar. If, um, if, if everything lines up for your home to do that. Um, there's a couple other things I wanna mention. Um, if you have your own solar panels, you can get backup batteries. They're currently quite expensive, but just like uh, if you remember the prices of personal computers and how the prices started to plummet, uh, we can look forward to that with uh, backup batteries for, for our solar panels. And another thing, let's say you get enough panels to cover your home and then you follow the program and you get signed up for heat pumps or, or, or then you get an electric car. So now your panels will no longer cover your annual usage. So ideally, one would plan ahead for this by knowing where a second and possibly a third set of, of solar panels can be installed. 
So we went solar with one set and then our second set was a ground mount system. Um, and one of the big advantages of this is that New York State tax credit, and I confirmed this today, Bill, uh, that New York State tax credit, it's by unit, it's not by house. So it's not like you can just do it once. If you do part of your solar this year and part next year, you can take $5,000 each year. If you do it all this year, you, you top out at $5,000. Good to know, huh? Definitely. Mm -hmm. Then, um, so anyone who has a residential electricity bill, but they don't currently have their own solar panels, they should sign up for community solar. So with community solar, a large field is filled with solar panels and the clean electricity generated is fed into the local grid. Only customers of the local utility are allowed to get allocations of the electricity that's produced there. The company that owns the panels will estimate the usage, the annual usage for each customer, and they'll allocate a percentage of what the solar farm produces to their customers. And nowadays they sell it to the customers at a 10% discount to what they would have paid if they'd not signed up for community solar. And this 10% discount just for signing up is the main reason that I would discourage people from leasing panels uh, that are built on their own homes. So in these leasing arrangements, you're not likely to save much more than 10%. And um, there, may be, there may be issues when you try to sell your home that would, in, that would interfere with selling. But, but in addition, as long as those panels are on there, you really have cut yourself off from the opportunity to buy them for yourself. So if it doesn't make financial sense to buy them yourselves just now, hold off on leasing, go for the community solar, and then um, when it does make sense, then, then go for the, for the outright purchase. Then there are often incentives for signing up for community solar. I think many of you know, we just did a triple win campaign. Um, you should look for an incentive bonus when you sign up for community solar. It could be $50 for you, it could be $100 for you, maybe also money for a local nonprofit. Um, if you're, if you're, when you're signing up for community solar, look for an incentive bonus to go with it. Um, up to now, everyone got a second bill for community solar that was separate from their original electric bill, but uh, the new farms will all have consolidated building and the billing that is, and the old farms will be transitioned over. So basically your community solar savings will just start showing up on your regular utility bill from ONR. And once again, it's available to just about everyone who has an electricity bill, but doesn't have solar panels. Some commercial accounts can't sign up. Some residents with too little electricity usage can't sign up, but most people are eligible. Uh, do we have any questions about that, Elizabeth? None in the chat. I will just say that we bought a home that did have ground mounted solar panels and it made us willing to pay more for the home because we were looking at our energy costs as part of the cost of owning the home. And so we thought that that was value that they had you know, put into the home. I think they had already reached their uh, payback time on the solar panels where they felt like they were getting energy for free, but we didn't you know, buy the panels ourselves, but we felt like, well, now we're going to get energy for free. And that pushed up our price point as compared to a house without solar panels. So I'll just make that plug. Okay, thanks. Okay, so, so we have just provided a three-step outline for how to transition a home, just about any home, to a net zero home. Some parts of the project will be more difficult than others, but if you do some planning, work with re reliable experts, and network with others on the same three-step project, the final product may be easier than you suspect. And we spent a good chunk of webinar time on climate solutions related to our homes, which are very energy intensive. But as residents of the Hudson Valley, we all have access to local food sources and many of us are blessed with land as well. Here's an interesting fact that's not well known. New York State has the smallest carbon footprint per person of all states in the union. But that's mainly because we have so many city dwellers in New York State. As rural New Yorkers, we have both opportunities and I think we have special responsibilities to, to take advantage of our resources in a climate friendly way. And uh, here's Mary to start telling us about those. Mary? Okay, so when you're making your food choices, um, the closer that you can get to local, closer, closer you can get to home, the better. 
So this little chart shows you starting from left to right, how close you can be and then just a little bit further away. Um, and then we'll show you some examples of all of these. First of all, you can grow your own food in your yard. Uh, you can have a small garden, you can have a large garden, whatever, um, but it's very rewarding to do this delicious food and it's nice to be out and do it. If you don't have the kind of sun or the kind of space in your yard uh, for a garden, you can join a community garden and we have two in Warwick. Um, and you will find other people very interested in gardening, other people who can give you some tips, some hints, and help you along, and it becomes a real community. You can also join a CSA, Community Supported Agriculture. This is a way of supporting local farmers as well as getting great local food. You pay the farmer up front at the beginning of the season, it's like an investment, and every week that farmer gives you a box or a bag or whatever of food that is that has come in that that um, week. The nice thing about this is some people say, well, I got this vegetable and I have no idea what this is. What do I do with this? Well, usually your farmer can tell you what to do with it. Often farmers will even give recipes for it and you may discover a new food that you didn't even know. Of course, you can also buy local food at a farmer's market or a farm stand. We have plenty of those in our area. There's some of our famous onions. And who has not discovered the moldy fruit at the back of the refrigerator, the slimy pepper in the produce drawer, or the leftovers from dinner that you forgot about? Well, that's not good because in this country, we waste a great deal of food. And we really want to not do that. It takes so much energy and time to grow that food. So we wanna make as good a use of it as we can. So we can learn to do better about this. There are many useful tips, um, including at the EPA's website, and that is on our resources page uh, so that you can reduce your food waste. Another thing to consider with food is the amount of meat that you eat. Because meat production is very energy intensive. It requires vast amounts of land for the crops, for the, for the animals. It uses fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, and a lot of water. And it also creates pollution, air, water, and soil pollution. It uses a large amount of fossil fuel energy. So in addition to not being very good for the planet, uh, excessive meat consumption is associated with increased disease, including heart attacks, stroke, and cancer. So this does not mean that you have to become a vegan or a vegetarian, but it would be a good idea to reduce the amount of meat that you eat. And it's easiest to do this a little bit at a time. I remember Years ago, I said I could never become a vegetarian, and now I'm very close to being one. You just gradually cut down a little bit. You gradually learn more recipes um, that use beans, nuts, seeds, um, and other things, grains, which are not meat-based. Also, more vegetarian and vegan diets are generally considered to be healthier. And, and then beyond, um, you know, beyond what we eat, there are other aspects of, as, as homeowners in the Hudson Valley, some of us have yards or, and, and so, uh, and there's so many things that we can do with a yard that are, that are beneficial for the, for the, for the climate. Mary? Right. So one of the first things is I was just driving around Warwick yesterday a lot and I realized the enormous number of huge lawns there are. So one of the things we can do is reduce our lawn size. Um, on the left, you can see here, this is a typical lawn, just lawn, okay? Um, we could see it as an ecological wasteland. It is not a normal ecology. Um, in terms of carbon capture, and there's just no ecosystem there. There's just not a lot of encouragement for any 
animals or insects, butterflies, whatever, to be there. So if we, would, if we were to plant more native trees, shrubs, and flowers, um, we would do several things. We would encourage pollinators, we would encourage animals, we would have a more balanced ecology in our yards. We would also eliminate a lot of toxins because many people do put herbicides and pesticides on their lawns and they may have um, gas fired um, lawn mowers that, that mow the lawns. So you can see on the right side, here is a much more interesting looking lawn. Uh, it's aesthetically pleasing, it's very pollinator friendly, and it's going to support some wildlife. So that is one thing we can do. And I was thinking about the enormous amount of trees, the number of trees that could be planted on some of these lawns. Instead of a lawn, you could actually have a forest. Uh, and that would be interesting. Um, I think you asked me to throw in the, the composter slide. Yes. Um, you know, there's a basic, there's so many ways to do compost. And I'm, I'm going to go through this very quickly. You can have a tumbler. You could make, um, you know, these, these different kinds of, of, of compost, uh, compost bins or whatever. And then uh, be sure at this time of year to collect lots and lots of leaves this autumn. Some people will collect them and put them in bags out on the street for you to take such a wonderful, they make such the, the, the most of your compost should be made from leaves. And, and as we all know, compost happens. <laughs> yes, it does. Yes, you don't actually, we do a lazy man's compost. We actually just bury the, uh, the scraps in, um, in the beds where we're not using, we're not growing anything at the time. And it decomposes very quickly during the summer and during the warm months. A friend of mine refers to that method as direct deposit. Direct deposit, yes. <laughs> um, and so at this point, um, with no further ado, do you want to tell us about the importance of advocating for change, Mary? Yes, okay. It's wonderful, whatever we can do as individuals is wonderful to help sustainability, to help support uh, our ecosystems and the earth. Um, but only large scale changes can have enough impact to really get us to a safe place on our planet. Um, each of us can contribute to those large scale changes by taking citizen action. And that citizen action is really an investment in our children and grandchildren, in the world they're going to inherit, and in our earth to preserve it as habitable for humans. I'm sorry. So ways you can contribute, there are many ways you can contribute. Uh, you can join an activist organization. And this has already been mentioned before uh, by Michael. It's a great way to get in contact with other people who are concerned with the kind of concerns you have. Um, I put Sustainable War Work there because we're local. Uh, but I also put some other organizations here. And the reason I chose these organizations is because I think they're very effective uh, in contributing to changes that we need to make. And some of them have specialties. You can see Food and Water Watch, where you can see what their main concerns are. River Keeper is concerned with the Hudson uh, River and, and its environs. Uh, some of these organizations are primarily lawyers. They are doing lawsuits to try to protect the environment. Some of them are lobbyists trying to get laws changed. Some do both. Um, some of them are really very active in trying to get citizens more um, understand, understanding better why we need to do these things. Um, and so you can pick whichever one of these, and again, this is on our resource list, how to contact these, these organizations, pick whichever one you seem to be particularly attuned to. And if you can't volunteer your time with that organization, you can donate money to an organization that is doing good work. Another thing that's really important is to contact your elected representatives because they need to know that we want them to support renewable energy and energy conservation and reduce fossil fuel use so we can transition to renewable energy and support sustainable agriculture. And now activist organizations are also really wonderful at giving you information about these issues and providing sample scripts for contacting elected officials. So again, see the resources checklist for that. 
Our elected officials here in New York, U.S. Senator Charles Schumer, U.S. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, and our new governor, Kathy Hochul. Um, and the resources checklist will help you to find out how to contact the above people and your U.S. representative, because we're in different districts, and state officials. Why does this matter? You can say, oh, I'm just one person. Are they going to pay attention to me? Yes, they do. They pay attention. Uh, they need to know how much support they have for taking stands. Uh, they want to know that the public is behind them, Okay, that they have somebody to cover their backs. Um, it's also very easy. Okay, Sometimes people are very intimidated. Oh, I don't know if I want to call the senator. Well, believe me, you will not speak with the senator. Um, you will speak with a staff member. You don't even have to speak with a staff member. You can leave a message. Um, it call, a call takes just a couple of minutes and it can be as easy as something like this. Hello, I am who you are in where you live and I'm urging you to pass legislation to support renewable energy and regenerative agriculture and quickly move away from fossil fuels. Thank you. That's it, as simple as that. Now, if you happen to know a bill, uh, the name of a bill that would be good for the earth, uh, good for saving energy, you can mention it uh, and say you're for passage. Give the number if you have it, but you don't have to. Basically, what the people who take this information down want to know, yes or no, you're for it, you're against it, okay? You don't have to give them any kind of a, you know, a, a, a research paper on it. They just want to know what your opinion is on it. And they do keep track of this. They do actually take the numbers down. Another thing you can do to be an advocate is just tell your friends, relatives, and neighbors. Tell them what you're doing. Share your concerns, your insights, what you learn, and your actions. If you get new solar panels on your house, tell people. Um, if you Start a compost heap, tell people how you did it, okay? You can also write a letter to the editor. Uh, and do people read those? Oh yes, people read letters to the editor. They are influential. Not only does the public read letters, but politicians have their staffs follow letters to the editor. So they're seeing what gets um, discussed in those letters. Hearing from others we know and trust can have a huge impact you're much more likely to take some action or research yourself, uh, research something yourself if somebody you know recommends it. And of course, vote and take everyone you know to the polls along with you. Thank you, Mary. We've, we're gonna close with a quick um, to-do list of immediate actions that people can take. The first one is to sign up for community solar. If you don't have your own solar panels, it's just so easy. Um, the next one is to get the home energy audit. Get an electric model, planning an electric model next time you get any of the things, a car, a, a heating and cooling system, stove, a water heater, clothes, you know, make, make plans to do this. Source your food locally. Become an advocate for climate solutions with friends, relatives, neighbors, and elected officials, and keep in touch. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased that um, everybody hung out with us for this whole hour here. We're happy to take questions next. Um, I am going to show our, our contact information so that um, actually we sent the, um, this is the, the email address from the, um, um, excuse me, where we sent the, the, the Zoom invite. So, so at this point, I don't need to share that anymore. Um, at this point, we can open up for questions. What questions do people have? Well, while people are thinking of their questions, I just wanted to say that um, one thing that I haven't yet done that I'm gonna put high on my priority list is trying to change some of our lawn into uh, a more pollinator friendly area, mostly because, and this might have come through in some of my other comments, I have lawn that I'm sick of mowing and I'm seeing less work on the other side. I know it's gonna be a bit of a, some, a job to actually 
plant those uh, pollinator friendly, uh, hopefully native plants. But then once it's done, I can kind of set it and forget it. And that's um, one of my big takeaways from tonight that I think you guys have really identified a number of areas that yes, there might be some sticker shock of an investment in the beginning, but then once you do it, and there are some other ongoing things that, that you all have identified, but I think once we do these things, we're really on our way to make our lives cheaper and simpler. So uh, I appreciate all of your thoughts tonight. Carol has asked a question if there are incentives for heat pumps and how you get rid of things. I'm happy to let other folks answer, but I actually did just put in um, last year geothermal, um, that's a, a ground source heat pump. And we did get about 50% of our system was covered through NYSERDA incentives and our federal tax credit. Um, and it's actually, it was amazing. Um, they took out those huge oil tanks and we reclaimed a good part of our basement, which we now are gonna use for other things, which we're really excited to have that space back. Um, and in our case, um, it just fed right into our ducts that were existing. So they just got rid of our old um, system, put a new system in its place. We replaced our heat and our cooling with a geothermal system. So it also uh, brought the condensers indoors. We don't have any outdoor uh, equipment anymore. And that is actually supposed to give it more longevity because it won't be exposed to the elements. Um, and we've been really pleased with the system. People have commented on how comfortable it is. And I can, I can actually monitor everything on my phone, including the kilowatt hour usage. And I see exactly how much it's using at what times. Um, so it's not only is it energy efficient, it's pretty cool. Uh, my neighbors are pretty interested in this. Um, I'd be happy to uh, talk to anybody who's considering getting geothermal and just letting them know what we learned through the process. Um, but I also don't want to steal the stage. I know uh, Michael and Bill and Mary know so much more about this than I do. Um, the, um, so the, 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 the rebates incentives are changing all the time. Um, they are much, they're, they're much, if you do a whole house system, you get a bonus. That's one thing I can say. Nowadays, they go through um, Orange and Rockland. Um, the way to, to find out is to find, uh, go on the Orange and Rockland site, find an approved installer, and get them to give you estimates. And again, like I said, for solar panels, don't just get one, get two or three. You might not, especially if you already have ducts, you should consider um, uh, geothermal, which will be more expensive up front but it has a much longer life. Um, and, but get quotes for all these things because the, the people who do the installations, they know all of the discounts and rebates. And so um, you know, that, that's how you will find out. And, and I think the person who asked that question, Carol, she's also asking, how does it affect humidity in the house? I can, you know, Bill was saying that his, his uh, heat pumps heat and cool, ours also has uh, a dehumidifying function. Um, and so, so there's that option as well. Okay. That too. Yeah. Eileen is there raising, Irene is there ga raising your hand. Go ahead, Irene. Yes, I want to know, I've been waiting how soon the uh, community solar will be on the Rockland billing system because my husband would rather go with that than not having an address or some place to definitely reach. Right, right, right. So when will they have consolidated billing? There are some people who just really don't want that second bill. It's just more of a nuisance than they think it's worth for their electric bill. Whatever, um, yeah. yeah. And... Um, is there any work being done on it now? Is there a forecast or maybe not? A friend of mine up in NYSEG territory sent me a copy of his first bill that was done consolidated billing. It's just a question of it's being implemented. And then they probably was supposed to be done by now, but of course it's been delayed. It should be anytime soon. Hopefully maybe by next I spring. Maybe I can put a letter in when we pay our bill. Maybe I can, can I put in something in writing? Is it worth doesn't, o &R won't listen. Should, okay. That's not their concern really. Good enough. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's so. That's that's not an effective way to bring that about. Right. Right. Okay. Well, thank you. Vanessa is asking: Are there rebates or incentives for switching to electric lawnmowers? I'm not that I'm aware of. Um, one of the other sustainable Warwick members bought an electric 
battery mower. And so she wondered if I wanted to buy her old plug-in mower uh, for 25 bucks. And I said, sure, that's a great deal. And I thought, wait a minute, this person, I don't have to think twice. Whatever kind of mower she bought, it must be a good deal. <laughs> so, so I went out and got one myself. And I actually still have that other one around that I use for other projects. Um, they're, they're, not, they're not that expensive. And, and also, you know, they, they always have that. Some problem's going to go wrong, and you have to take a gas-powered mower for maintenance. And so if you look at the price of an electric mower, you think, ah, there's a little bit more than I want. Just stop to think you're not going to pay any maintenance on it, most likely. for You're not going to pay maintenance on it. You may need to get a new battery after a few years, take care of the batteries while you can. Um, but um, it's, it's, uh, it, it, as far as we know, there are no rebates, but it's not a terrible deal to, to do it. I'll also add, um, we got an electric mower and we happened to get from the Ego line. And I was pleased to learn that they make the ability to plug the batteries into like a little portable generator. So when we were having some power issues, we don't have a generator in our home. And I just actually attached this little top to the, the um, one of our batteries and took it down to the basement where my boys were playing. And so if the power went out, I didn't have to hear them screaming because they were down in, in basement darkness. Um, so it was nice to have that. And it's also been a lifesaver. I used to borrow my neighbor's lawnmower and got stuck in the driveway once where it was out of fuel and I didn't realize this is all digitized for me. It, it tells me what my percentage is of battery remaining. I don't ever have to worry that I don't have gas on hand. So I've been a big fan and it, it's, it's also really cool. It has like LED lights and um, anyway, I'll stop going off on that. But even without the, the tax credit, I thought it was a worthwhile investment. And I should got, I can do like two acres on one charge. So it's, uh, it, they're heavy duty machines. We've got neighbors who were skeptical about whether batteries could hold up to gas power and it's doing the job. Do we have more questions? I think this is almost done. Mm. Sorry. Eileen, uh, Michael, Eileen had a question about um, contacts. That's on the resources page, right? Yes. Um, we'll, I'll be, the, the, the resources page is all the final touches put on it. In the next day or two, we'll be emailing out a copy of the resources page. It'll be a PDF with check boxes. You can say, this doesn't apply to me. This one I've done already and sort of see where you are on the three steps we were talking about before. Um, it's almost finalized. And we'll also ask you for a little bit of response to the webinar uh, and, and um, the um, Sustainable Hudson Valley has asked us to ask for everyone to do a little bit of a, um, a survey uh, so that they can, you know, and, and that will also help us understand about how this, served, how, the, how this went for everybody. It'll also take us a little while to get the, um, the video posted. Uh, I see Peter's there. Maybe he's going to help us do that. He's always helped that for the Zoom garden plot. Um, um, but um, uh, in the next day or two, we'll be sending that resource list around. Great. Well, on behalf of all the participants, I want to say thank you to Michael and Bill and Mary. Thanks for all of your insights and helpful tips. And, and we want to thank everyone for staying around through the, through the whole webinar. And, um, and really, please keep in touch. Thank you.